we're talking about lots of different kinds of solids here. And um, I really am, want more of a, a big idea of all these different types of things rather than having you memorize the little nitty gritty details of this. I just want you to be aware of most of this stuff. So ceramics. Uh, traditionally, a ceramic is an inorganic, non-metallic solid. And they're made from powders. Usually, you take that powder, you mix it with water, and then it's heated. So ceramics are used to make bricks, tile, pottery, dishes, insulating elements, etc. They're typically very hard, very strong. Uh, they don't conduct electricity, and they tend to be brittle. Um, you probably experienced that. You know, you get a if you took a ceramics class and made some, you know, vase or something, and then you drop it on the floor, it's going to shatter, right? Because it's brittle. There are different types of ceramics. So silicate ceramics are composed of aluminosilicates. So this is a silicate silicon oxygen solid where some of the silicon atoms are replaced with aluminum. And this happens naturally um, in, in the environment. If you have alumina, aluminosilicates that weather, they produce clays. So clays are powdered forms of aluminosilicates mixed with water. And so those can be found naturally in the environment. They can also be made. You take this clay and you heat it, and that forms a ceramic. So one type of clay is kaolinite, and it has this crazy formula. You heat that above 1,500 degrees Celsius, it undergoes chemical and structural changes that are not reversible. So that clay that was moldable becomes a white ceramic solid. It's got an extended network with silicon oxygen and aluminum oxygen tetrahedra. They're covalently bonded. Kaolinite is the main and most important component in porcelain. So those fine porcelain china dishes, we call them china because it originated in China. Those contain kaolinite. Um, there are also oxide ceramics. Um, these include um, Al203 and MgO. These are physically and chemically stable at high temperatures. They're useful in furnaces, uh, industrial furnaces, high-speed cutting tools, crucibles. So we didn't use the little ceramic crucibles, except we practiced carrying them around. But those little ceramic crucibles, um, you can heat chemicals in them to a very high temperature, and the ceramic is fine. It doesn't come apart or, or or melt or anything. Um, oxide ceramics are also useful in uh, heating elements and fireproofing. So if you're buying a space heater for the winter, um, some of them are ceramic. It's a ceramic heating element. And it's an oxide ceramic that um, is heated and then it, it gives, um, well, it's the heating element. Um, then there are also non-oxide ceramics. So these don't have oxygen in them. The others had oxygen. So silicon nitride is a network covalent solid. Um, but instead of oxygen, we've got nitrogen atoms. Um, this is useful in engine parts. You can make ball bearings that are not metallic. Um, most, you think of ball bearings, you think of little metal marbles, basically, right? Um, these would not be metallic. Um, you can have boron nitride. So boron nitride is isoelectronic with C2. So you've got, um, if you look at C2, that would have, each carbon atom has four valence electrons, right? If you look at boron nitride, Boron has three valence electrons. Nitrogen has five. So it's an element one larger and one smaller than carbon. And so together, they've got the same number of valence electrons. And so they can form structures that are similar to those formed by carbon. 
including the layered sheets, similar to diamond, I'm sorry, graphite, and the three-dimensional structure similar to diamonds. So these are useful as uh, lubricants that can function at a very high temperature. The thing about carbon is if you heat it to a high temperature, it can burn, right? And so that's not so great. Uh, but boron nitride will be stable at higher temperature. Um, it can be used as a, an abrasive and as a cutting tool. Um, then there's silicon carbide. This is the same structure, the same lattice as a diamond, but half of the carbon atoms have been replaced with silicon atoms. And so that's used as an additive to steel, again, an abrasive, high temperature material. So then there's also cement. Cement is pretty important. Um, it was first discovered by the Romans. They used lime, not the fruit, um, volcanic ash and clay, and they made a pourable slurry that would then harden into a rock-like structure. So this is neat because you know it's this thick liquid basically and you can form it how you want and then if you let it dry it becomes very hard and rigid. Um, there are different kinds of cements. Portland cement is um, a powdered mixture. It's mostly limestone, calcium carbonate, and silica and it's got smaller amounts of alumina, iron 3 oxide, and gypsum in it. It reacts with water it undergoes a, a series of complex reactions to produce a rock-like substance. So a cement is different than a ceramic because a cement, when it dries, has undergone chemical reactions and is, you can't reverse those just by adding more water to it. When a clay dries, it just loses water and if you put the water back in, you can regenerate the moldable clay. Part of what happens in, this, uh, in the uh, hardening of Portland cement is we get silicon oxygen silicon bridges that form, and those um, create fibrous structures that hold things together. Concrete is different than cement. So in you know, everyday life, we tend to use them interchangeably. But concrete is a mixture of cement with sand and pebbles. Um, this is the most widely used building material in the world. It dramatically revolutionized, rev man, I can't talk this morning, revolutionized um, construction. So. You're familiar with concrete. We use it to make foundations, walls, buildings, etc. I mean, you look out in the hallway, what's the floor made out of? It's made out of concrete. Mixture of cement with sand and pebbles. Um, glass. So if you take silica, that SiO2, and uh, heat it up above about 1,500 degrees, it will melt. And if you cool it quickly, those silicon and oxygen atoms form a randomly ordered structure, not a crystalline structure, but a randomly ordered structure, and we call that glass. So uh, sand can be used to make glass. Silicate glass is transparent. It's impervious to water. So it's great for making windows and drinking glasses. The Romans were the first to extensively make glass. Um, they found that adding sodium carbonate reduced the melting point. 1,500 degrees Celsius is hard to achieve. It's very, very hot temperature. By adding sodium carbonate, the glass will melt at a lower temperature. So this makes it easier to work with. And they also developed glass blowing, where you take melted glass and blow it into spherical shapes using a tube and uh, people can create some pretty fantastic things by blowing glass. There are other types of glass. 
Um, vitreous silica or fused silica is a glass made just from silica, SiO2. It's very hard, um, has a high melting point. Um, it has a low thermal expansion coefficient. What that means is when you heat it, it doesn't change its density very much. It doesn't expand very much. It's transparent to visible and ultraviolet light. So vitreous silica glass is not going to protect you at all from ultraviolet rays from the sun. It's very expensive because it requires really high temperatures to make. So soda lime glass is where um, sodium oxide and calcium oxide are added. Um, this is the most common modern glass. It's used for making windows and other useful things. Um, it is not transparent to ultraviolet light, so it gives you some protection from a sunburn. Um, it does have a high thermal expansion coefficient. So when it's heated, it expands significantly. Um, and so it tends to crack under thermal shock. So you probably have learned by experience that if you have a hot glass object, you should not cool it suddenly, right? Don't take that glass straight out of the hot dishwasher and put ice water in it, right? It'll probably break on you. That's because of the thermal expansion. But it's much less expensive to make and it's easier to form into useful shapes. So that's soda lime glass. Then there's borosilicate glass. The, the trademark name for this is Pyrex. So if you've got a glass baking dish, this is going to be Pyrex, not soda lime glass. Because soda lime glass, you stick that in the oven with your lasagna in it, and um, the chances of it cracking are pretty good. Pyrex is much more resistant to um, changes in temperature. So this has uh, boric oxide in it instead of calcium oxide. Uh, smaller, smaller thermal expansion. So you can do heating and cooling and heating and cooling that would shatter soda lime glass. Most of the lab glassware that we use is Pyrex. Some of the test tubes that we have are soda lime glass. And those are great for a lot of things but you don't want to heat those in a Bunsen burner flame directly or they will crack on you. So whenever you heat a test tube, you want to make sure it's a Pyrex test tube. Then there's leaded glass, um, often called crystal. So this has lead oxide in with the silicon oxide. Um, it has a higher index of refraction. So light interacts with it in a different way than normal glass and so it has a more brilliant appearance. Um, it also makes a ringing sound when tapped. So if you just look at a crystal goblet, say, and one made out of glass, um, unless you look closely, you're not necessarily going to notice much of a difference. But the crystal goblet is going to just have a more brilliant shine to it. And if you tap them both, you can hear the difference in how how they sound. Um, leaded glass contains lead, right? And so you don't want to use a leaded glass or a crystal decanter to, say, store um, liqueurs in because over time the lead can leach out into the liqueur and then you drink it and that's not good, lead toxicity. So there are lead-free crystals that have been developed. 